What is up, everybody? It is Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning The Dr. Vibe Show. As always, I like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. Also know I am a certified empowerment coach and president and CEO of Express Your Vibe Coaching and Communications. And we are blessed and highly favored to have another new friend on The Dr. Vibe Show. And you know how I love having people from the T-Dot Toronto on the conversation because I'm really excited and Jack when I get fellow Torontonians on, on, the, on the conversation. Remember, I'm the host of Epic Conversations and also this is the place for Epic Conversations. Our new friend is Dr. Stephen DeWitt. He's a board-certified sexologist through the American College of Sexologists. He holds a Master of Public Health in Human Sexuality and a Doctorate of Human Sexuality. Toronto's Hassel Fee Clinic is where Stephen started as a sexual health counselor and now travels both nationally in Canada and internationally speaking about sexual empowerment. As a sexual educator, coach, and consultant, he is committed that people live in a sexually empowered life free from guilt, shame, and fear and have relationships that work. He is regularly featured on, in national newspapers and television shows and radio, providing relevant, thought-provoking sex education and information. He's a master at creating a fun, safe, comfortable environment for people to take an honest look at their sex lives and transform what he what is not working. So he's going to be sharing about a number of conversation pieces tonight. Also, he's going to be appearing this Sunday at the Men and Masculinity Summit in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. We'll talk about that later. And he's also going to talk about his book. So first things first, welcome, Stephen. We finally got it going. <laughs> Dr. Vibe, it's great to be here. And, uh, you know, this is take two. Yes. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you and uh, be with all your listeners as well. Thank you so much. Uh, we're really blessed to have you. So like we like to do with all new friends on the Dr. Vibe Show, can you share a little background about yourself? We got the professional end. What a, you know, life growing up, kid, kid being family, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia, specifically North Van, more specifically Lynn Valley, was where I was born and raised, and that's where my family's from. Um, and, you know, traditional kind of middle class, uh, experiences growing up, but always fascinated with the topic of sex. And it, it, there was a couple things that influenced, I think, where I am today inside of that. The first one was I grew up Catholic, right? I was an all-boy for seven and a half years. That was, you know, where I developed my love of speaking in front of people because I saw the power of the priest on the pulpit being able to actually communicate this message. And I was like, wow, that's, there's something in there, and I'd love to be able to do that. So that's where I developed that. But I also, around sex, there was this very polarized view of what was good and then what was bad. And even if you thought about what was bad, so I'd go to church, you know, I'd hear the sermon that it's bad, don't even think about it. And then I'd walk outside and I'd look around or I'd like watch a movie or I'd see an advertisement. And so for me, that was, I was really fascinated with that and really curious about that. And then one of the other pivotal points in my, my life that led me on this journey was, um, growing up, and, and it was grade nine, I remember, so I was about 13, 12, 13 years old, and I found out that one of the uh, my friends that I had grown up with, you know, like neighborhood kids that I'd hang out with um, and play with, um, had been sexually abused from the ages of like nine to 14 or something like that. Wow. And that, that really, it really rocked me and I was upset I remember coming home from school and crying and, and, and being really sad about that and what was there was um, why didn't you tell me I would have done something now the thing was Dr. Bribe is I was a year younger than her so you know her telling an eight-year-old that like, I wouldn't have the capacity or you know language or whatever to really grasp what was going on but that was one of those moments that I was like this is wrong if I could do something about this to change this so no one else has to go through this that's something that I can dedicate my life to. So, you know, grew up, I was always kind of like the odd guy out. Um, I asked my mom, you know, I, have I always been like this? My mom said, Stephen, you know, you, you would always dance to the rhythm of your own drum. And if you didn't like the rhythm, you'd kind of build your own drum. And so that's what I've kind of done is, is you know, people say, sexologist, what the heck is that? What do you do? And I laugh. I say, my mom still asks me the question. My dad wants to know the answer. doesn't want to know the answer. Right? right, so it's it's something that I grew up, went to university, yeah. uh, UBC, and then moved here 13 years ago, and then went back to school uh, eight years ago, once I kind of figured out my passion and what I wanted to do and how to build that, 
and then I've just been building the business and building the brand and, and just loving what I do um, ever since. That's fantastic. I just want to highlight a little bit more about the early days, the young Dr. DeWitt, before you became a doctor days. Yep. Um, you said your pet, your mother said basically gave you free reign. So were your parents that way that allowed you to produ pers uh, pursue your interests? Well, I, I don't know if allowed. I know. Well, that's what I'm. That's what I'm getting to. Like, you know, not too many parents will say, "Yeah, it's okay to pursue, you know, a career in sexology." Yeah, you know, it was. It was always. I don't. Hmm. You know, so my my dad is is the the, the strict one, right? Dutch, uh, uh, strict Catholic, CEO, CFO, corporate. You know, that was his world. My mom was more of the free spirit. She was a nurse, so talking about your body and sex was always something that was on the table. Um, but my mom's more of that that free spirited type of person, and I don't know if whether it was approving or just like it was always like I've always been different. I got kicked out of elementary school, got kicked out of high school, got kicked out of university. Wow, like, it was always a, a good kid, but I had all this energy, and I I didn't quite think the same way, right, or approach things the same way, or would be willing to accept like that this is the status quo and this is the way it's it's going to be. So. Um, you know, those were my early years, and, and, you know, when I moved out to Toronto, my parents were like, what the F is Stephen doing? Like, really, I, and I was first moved out here, I, I worked in nightclubs, so I bartended, I ran security teams, I managed big nightclubs here in Toronto, and I was a glorified bar star for the first number of years as I was trying to figure myself out, and my parents are back in Vancouver, like, why did Stephen, you know, quit his corporate job to move to Toronto? Right. And so those years were, were tough for my parents, and, and they were tough for me. I moved here with no job, no place to live, no money. Uh, I would eat cereal three meals a day and, you know, try and figure out who I, who I, who the man was that I wanted to become and what was the life and the lifestyle that I wanted to live. And then I was like, hey, I'm going to school. And my parents were like, oh, thank goodness, Stephen's going to school, right? And then I was like, yeah, I'm going to study sex. My parents <laughs> were like, holy jeez. <laughs> And we catch a break. So then it was all these years of doing my master's and then doing my doctorate and being like, well, what, what are you, you're studying sex. Like, what are you going to do afterwards? Like, right. it's not like you do like accounting and then you're going to become an accountant or something like that. Like, what, what does that actually look like? So, you know, I think my parents were, um, uh, you know, cautiously optimistic. Right. And then, you know, over the last couple of years, you know, my, my dad would always ask, I tell him all these things and my dad you know, coming from an accountant, CEO, CF background, I'd be like, I tell him all these great things, and my dad would be like, Stephen, how much money's in the bank account? And exactly. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm investing in myself, Dad. Yeah. Right? Like, but over the last couple of years, where they're like, okay, they can, you know, see me on TV, or I'm in the paper, or I'm speaking at this event, or I'm, then it's like, okay, you know, as, you know, as parents, you know, I appreciate they want the best for me, and they Absolutely. want, you know, the safest route, and their safest route just looked really different than the route that I've taken so far. Was there a moment in your journey so far that they said, Stephen, we're proud of you? Yeah. Oh, man, my, my father. Yeah. Whoo! Um... So I, I spoke at a, uh, for, you know, all intents and purposes, something that you wouldn't think a sexologist speaks at, but I speak at all sorts of different conferences. So I spoke at um, a, dent, a dental conference, and it was the Toronto Academy of Dentistry. And I spoke, it was last March, and uh, they had me coming in. I did the opening keynote, and then I did two breakout sessions. And um, what had happened is my dad has retired, but he sits on a board um, back in Vancouver, of a company and one of the um, attendees and one of the, the, the past uh, board members of the Toronto Academy of Dentistry sits on the same board as my dad. So my dad is in this board meeting virtually, so he's, uh, he's on a phone call because the, the board meeting physically took place here in Toronto. So my dad's physically um, in Vancouver on a call and so they finish their board meeting. And uh, the gentleman who was at the actual conference was there and said, you know, are, are we done all the, you know, the, the, the minutes on the agenda? Everything was complete. And he said, I just want to let you know that John DeWitt's son um, came and spoke at our conference and was absolutely spectacular. And so my dad got a round of applause. Outstanding. Um, from the other board members. And then, and then this is the thing. When my, my mom was telling me this story, when my, my dad was telling my mom what happened, he had tears in his eyes. Wow. 
And so that is is one of those moments that my dad was proud of me. And yeah. it's it's the first time in over I don't know, 15, 20 years that I at least I can recall. My dad may have been proud or may have expressed yeah. it, but I I didn't hear it the way he intended it that my dad was actually proud of me that that I did something and it was like, okay, Stephen, Stephen's making something out of his life. I'm sure you'll never forget that moment as long as you live. No. No. And I think it's a great tie-in, and we'll talk a little bit later about the men in masculinity, but I think that's a really good story mm -hmm. that I, I hope someone asks you about her at a conference, but at least we got it out here live. That's great. So how, what was the path on getting all this accreditation for mm. doing this? Because it, it doesn't sound like it was a short path. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't short, and it wasn't cheap. Um you know, but but again, I love challenging myself and, and putting myself in, in situations where I experience pressure and and I'm forced to kind of like evolve and perform because if not, I just get fat and lazy, literally and figuratively. So I was at a place in my life where I built my, my speaking career and um, my coaching practice, but I was it's kind of like a, a jack of all trades, master of nothing. So if someone was going to pay me to speak about, you know, like water bottles, Guess what? I do my research on water bottles, and I would come in, and I would I would do my thing. And so I've been doing that for a couple of years, and had some some success in that. But one of my mentors said, Stephen, for you to actually get to the level that you want to get to, you have to pick an area of specialization. You have to pick a niche. People have to know you for something. Be able to build the brand from there. So it was you know sitting down and thinking about well what what is the thing that I'm most fascinated with and most passionate about? And anyone who's known me more than 10 minutes is like, oh yeah, sex is just kind of Stephen's thing. And it was going out for dinner with an old friend of mine, an old radio friend from back in my radio days. I was with uh, CIUT 89.5 for a number of years and had a show there, a gentleman by the name of Andy Frank. And I sat down with him and I was, we went for Korean barbecue on Yonge Street. And uh, I sat down. I said, "Hey, Andy, like I'm, I'm thinking about you know pursuing like this area of like sex and sexuality as far as an area of expertise, and like I've been looking at some school and stuff like that." And he was like, "Stephen, he's like, you have a gift. He's like, you can connect with people and you can talk to people like nobody I've ever met before." And he's like, "Go for it, pursue it." So I went back, and um, you know, I was looking and I said, "Okay, one, I knew I I'd read everything I possibly can by at like chapters in Indigo." Two, I knew that I was blissfully ignorant about a lot of things around sex. I had my own experience and what I had learned. And three, I needed credibility, right? So part of um, my journey in this is, is not being the guy who's walking down the street and be like, oh, there's that sex guy and he's the sex expert because he's had lots of sex, right? Versus, hey, he can bring a whole breadth of knowledge and wisdom and understanding and he's been trained and he's been, you know, exposed to... Um, the, the academic side of things as well, not just what I call the field research side of it as well. So started doing um, research um, and I went to, I uh, did my master's at a place called the Institute for the Advanced Studies of Human Sexuality in San Francisco. And so if you're going to study sex, you know, why not go to San Francisco? It's such a, a sex cause. <laughs> no better place probably. Right? And fun place to be. So it was balancing between being in San Francisco and having my life in Toronto. And wow. when I went to school, there wasn't any Airbnb. So I'm, you know, paying for, you know, staying there and carrying rent here and working. And I was working three jobs and, and making it all work. Um, then did my, my placement here at the Hassle-Free Clinic in Toronto, which is uh, the largest anonymous HIV testing site in Canada. And that was, that experience was just you know, to, to deal with humanity on such a level where anything that walks in the door, you're good with. Right. Like, there's that's the space. It's, it's hassle-free. So however people choose to express themselves, whatever they're dealing with, uh, however they connect, whatever their um, identity, orientation, relationship status, you just got to be great with it. And so that's where I, I, I really developed my ability to um, just be with people and, um, you know, coming from a place of love and support for that person in a professional context. Um, so that was uh, invaluable education. Then I went back and did uh, my doctorate and finished that in 2012. And so it, it's, been, uh, it's been a journey. <laughs> Tell me if you can remember the moment that you got that day you got your doctorate. You're officially 
named as a doctor. How was that feeling? <laughs> well, it was it was a bit of a mixed a bit of a mixed bag of emotions. Like one was like, "Yay, I'm done." And then the other one was like, "Oh my goodness, I'm $120,000 in debt." Oh my and so gosh. Wow. One of, one of the one of the stories that I have is is uh, and it's a magical story that I have is um, I went that day closed my RBC account because that's where all my loans and everything else like that. So I was like, I got to close that, but I got to open something else up. And I went down and it was living on Queens, York and Queens key at that time. Yep. Downtown and, uh, Toronto. Yep. Uh, yeah. And then I was, I went to uh, a Sobeys there and they had a, a president's choice, which has re recently been rebranded, but was um, PC financial and, and went and met this guy there and his name was Vince and this, this, this really nice guy, and he helped me out and got this card. And Vince has been one of my biggest champions for the last wow. five years. Good and stuff. has seen me, he's like my social media champion. And but he was that that day, I was like, I got it. I had to like deal with this. So I was like, yay. And then, oh my goodness, what I do with my finances, went to the bank and met Vince. And he's just been a man who's had my back four or five years and has been nothing but a champion and randomly the guy that I was working at PC Financial. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I th it's always important when we have new friends on for the first time on the on our conversation to get a little background so people can know a little bit about you. So we're just now going to get into some of the stuff. And there's some specific conversation pieces you wanted to address during mm -hmm. our conversation. So let's talk. Let's start right out of the back of the box here. Common male myths. They mm -hmm. still exist. What are some of the common male myths that are out there when it comes to sex and sexuality? Yeah. Um, so uh, as a man... Um, and as men, there's a traditional narrative that we're taught that for us to be men, um, this is who we are, right? So we always want sex, right? We have the biggest penis. We always satisfy our partner. We can go for hours and our partners are all female, right? That's the narrative like across the board that, that we're taught. And the reality is, is we're not sex robots, we're not, we're not sexual athletes. We're not porn stars. And unfortunately, there's, you know, there's a lot of men that, that will look at that and, and be like, okay, that's the default sex education if they're not getting sex education. Um, and or they'll look back in their lives of like, oh, remember when I was 20 years old and my body looked like this and my body responded like this. And so a lot of these myths, while you know, they're maybe interesting things to aspire to, but even that can get in the way of people's, you know, connecting the way that they want to with their partner or their partners um, can be detrimental in how men construct their sexuality and how men believe that they have to be in a relationship or in the sex that they have with their partner. Now, and it's interesting you mentioned that. I want to delve back. Where do most men get their education, if any... When it comes to sex and sexuality, because we live in Ontario, which is a province of Canada, where they've just over the last few years began to, I guess, step up about sex ed and sexual education. But back when you and I were going to school, if we heard about it, it was very limited. So it, where, what do you think of the status of the education men are getting when it comes to the world of sex? Well, I think, you know, to piggyback off your point, Dr. Vibe, I think it's getting better. It's heading in the right direction, but it's still lacking. So um, sex education, again, from, you know, men in our generation was more fear-based. Like, uh, don't do it. And if you do do it, these are going to be the repercussions, right? So it's more health-based, um, you know, uh, 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 safer sex, right? So don't do it is, is always best. And if you're going to do it, this is how you use a condom, and if you do do it, don't get pregnant, and if you do do it, you can get an STI, or at that time we called it STDs. So more of like a fear-based. Pleasure wasn't talked about, consent wasn't talked about, um, you know, uh, empowering people to make healthy decisions and choices for themselves, how to negotiate and navigate um, conversations around sex was really lacking. And, you know, that... I said we're heading in the right direction, but there are some men who don't get any sex education at all. Or, you know, some of the states, they have abstinence-only education, which is mandated in their school system. So it's, it's don't 
don't do it, and that's the best sex education, right? And and it's, you know, again, study after study comes out saying that, you know, abstinence only doesn't work, and um, the increased rate of unplanned pregnancy and STIs is elevated in those in those places where they only teach that. Mm. So that's one one place it comes from. Um, another place sometimes it's within um, the uh, the family setting, if people are lucky. Um, that's something that's discussed. But again, with a lot of a lot of people that I talk, it's like our our parents haven't worked through some of their um, baggage around sex or their shame or their guilt. So then that gets passed on from generation to generation to generation about what are those um, messages that they received, either explicit or implicit inside of what was communicated, how it was communicated, or what wasn't communicated. So often people say, will say to me, well, Stephen, I didn't, it really wasn't discussed. So as a child or as a teenager, as you're really curious about this, there's hormones going on, you're horny all the time, you're trying to figure stuff out, and it's never discussed. Um, you know, if it's not discussed, you know, as kids, we're really intuitive. We know that's a bad thing, that's a wrong thing, we shouldn't do it. You know, other other sources are, are mainstream media, you know, movies, books that we read. And then, you know, in, in these days, uh, it's uh, it's porn and and men going to that for, oh, this is what sex looks like or this is how, you know, I connect with partners or, or this is what I should be or this is how I should act. In the area of media, and because it's become so powerful, and especially the power of social media these days, mm -hmm. do you feel that arena is getting better when it comes to addressing common male sexual myths because social media is just so powerful these days and has so much influence, probably getting the point as much as traditional media. Um, yes, I think the opportunity is there um, for men to have a more authentic voice and to be heard. And, you know, there's also... It's also an interesting time for male sexuality because it has, um, and, you know, we're, we're seeing this often with all the allegations, sexual harassment, sexual abuse, um, the hashtag Me Too that's come out. Like, male sexuality is a very dangerous thing and it's used as a, a violent tool. And that's the, the main discourse that's happening on social media right now. I think it's an important one to have. I think... Um, uh, you know, people need to wake up to uh, what's been happening on many levels and, and have this be a vehicle to put a stop to it. But on the flip side of things, I think there's also, you know, an opportunity inside of the social media spectrum to talk about healthy male sexuality and what that looks like, giving men a voice to discuss it, to talk about it, a safe place to talk about it. Because really, we don't have that as men. It's more of a, gener generally speaking, uh, like a bravado, locker room, bragging type of thing. Not like, oh, geez, like, I don't know what to do in this situation, or I don't feel good about this, or this happened, and what do I do, or I'm kind of scared about this. Mm -hmm. Those type of conversations are limited, unfortunately, to, you know, the walls that we create in our own head and, you know, the conversations that we have with ourselves. Excellent. Uh, just a, a little bit more on this conversation piece. Do you see the millennial generation dealing with this better than their predecessors? Uh, better, better is an interesting word. Um, I think millennials um, are more uh, aware and more open-minded about um, sex, about sexuality, and relationships. So one of the main things and influences and impacts uh, in this direction is the fact that a lot of mill millennials grew up uh, with a single parent. Right. So that, uh, you know, that bond, that marriage bond that is um, the primary f focus for a lot of people, millennials grew up and were like, well, I had a single parent, so... And I'm, I'm okay, I'm fine, there's nothing wrong with me. So is marriage the only way that I'm going to connect with someone? And so millennials are in this interesting place of looking at what designer, the term that, that we use is what designer relationships could look like. So like, hey, I want this part, but like this part over here, like, no, I don't see the value in that or that really doesn't work for me. So how do I actually design a relationship? 
and have it work for me and have it work for my partner or have it work for my partners. So I think there's more um, questions that are being asked and it's not just the default that we grew up in is it was what I call the relationship escalator, right? You get on the first step and then you're dating someone and then you spend more time with them and then you're exclusive, you're having sex and then uh, you move in together with them and then you know you have a dog or a fish and then you get married and then you have kids and then like it's just that thing is like oh okay when you like someone this is what you do right but i think there's more conversations in the the millennial um world about hey it doesn't have to look like this and what what does work for me and how do i kind of mix things up a little bit and and not having to conform with the the relationship escalator that we were taught essentially you know we could spend the rest of the time just on this topic but we can move on so i'm I'm gonna i'm gonna ask hopefully sometime when you're off your touring that we come back because i think there's a whole conversation about family dynamic and sexuality and just the point you brought up there about single parent families and how that has an effect on Mm -hmm. male sexual i think that's a whole topic of itself well parking lot that Let's move on, though. Let's get yep. to sexual challenges when it comes to man and sexuality. Yeah. Let's talk about the uh, you know, big pink elephant in the room. And one thing that I do a lot of work around uh, and partner with different clinics here in Toronto with penis problems. Right? So, again, a lot of our power, a lot of our masculinity, a lot of our identity, a lot of our prowess... A lot of our pride is tied up with what's between our legs. And if that's not working or working as well as we'd like it to, that can cause a lot of issues. So it's not uncommon that my phone rings from someone in my, and and not clients, but in my social circle, and I pick up the phone and they're like, Stephen, you know, I don't know what happened last night, but, you know, this happened, my penis didn't work and like it didn't get hard or it didn't stay hard or, you know, I didn't orgasm or whatever, it, whatever they're dealing with. And it's like end of days. Like it is like we're tapping out, like we're done. We got, we're never having sex again. <laughs> and again, this, this ties into those myths that we always have to be this. We always have to, you know, be put together. The reality is, is we're human. And we have those experiences, and any man on the planet has had or will have challenges with what's going on with what's between their legs. And it's it's natural, it's uh, normal um, for us to experience that, and not the the dangerous. And, and this is oversimplifying things, but the dangerous part where most men go is they think about it, and they're up in their heads, and they're worried about it, and that further distances themselves from having that connection. I always like to say sex happens between your ears before it happens between your legs. So if between your ears you're like, oh my goodness, that happened, is it gonna happen again? I'm gonna do this, you know, am I, is she gonna tell other people is this is like the, the worst thing that's ever happened to me. You're stressing out about it. Your body's not in that relaxed, sexual flow state where your body can respond the way that you want it to. So then it comes this like cycle of Um, a self-fulfilling prophecy of your penis not doing what you want it to do. So that's some of the things that, you know, I do a lot of work with men on um, because it is a real pain point. You know, the the amount of spam that you get in your inbox about penis enhancement, pumps, pills, potions is, you know, ridiculous. And it's really um, that insecurity that men have that it always needs to do what I want it to do. And we're not robots and we go through things in our lives where we are stressed or we are sad or we are overwhelmed or we are struggling with something in our lives. But, oh, no, my dick's got to do what it's got to do because if not, (laughs) right? So, you know, bringing some humanity in that conversation with men um, and, and empowering them and not having that place of shame because, listen, I've dealt with it. Um, you know, and it'll probably show up again in my life. Why? Because I have one, you know, and um, so it's it's one of those things that I think is important for men to, you know, develop some compassion for themselves mm-hmm. and some understanding that this is, you know, a part of your body and it doesn't um, operate by, you know, pushing a button and then it works. There's Sex is a very complex thing 
And there's many factors that go into having you be at a place where you do feel comfortable, you do feel confident, you do feel competent and connected with your partner such that your penis does what you want it to do. What what percentage of first calls do you get that deal with this subject? <laughs> I, well, I, I have a feeling it's high, but I'd like to know just off the top of your head, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a little bit interesting for me to answer because I get referrals from different health clinics, men's health clinics here in Toronto. So it's, it's a high percentage, right? So I would say, um, and I work with women, I work with couples, um, I work with lots of different people, but I would say at least 50% is, um, as far as my, my male clientele, comes around issues with their penis and um, it not performing the way that they want it to perform. Excellent. Well, let's move on to the next conversation piece here, and I think it piggybacks over what we're just chatting about: issues with the mismatched libido. Yeah, yeah. So again, this is this is something that's very common, and um, you know, as men, we're the ones who are the sexual aggressors. You know, we're the ones that are taught that we need to want it all the time, or pursue it all the time, or initiate it all the time, and. I don't know about you know some of the other men listening, but that's freaking exhausting. I don't want to do that all the time. <laughs> and you know, it, it's it's also tied into a, a you know can cause some challenges in inside of that narrative that women aren't supposed to be that. Women aren't supposed to want sex all the time. Women aren't supposed to initiate. Women aren't supposed to be ready for sex. And you know, this may be a shock for some men here, but women are sexually superior. Um, animals, if we want to look at it that way, compared to men, right? Women as they... Wow. As they age, A men, some men may not want to hear that. Some men do not want to hear that. But like the reality, if you look at us as, as animals, as, as, you know, just the base of who we are and our, our sexual organs and how they function and, and um, you know, our hormones and just how our body performs, we peak, you know, early, where women they peak later and over a longer duration of time. Now, again, I'm generalizing here, but um, the other thing is, um, you know, women's, uh, women have a clitoris. That is the only organ on male or female that is solely there for the purpose of pleasure. And the concentration of nerve endings in that little, ex that little exposed part is far greater than the nerve endings that we have in the, in the head of our penis. Also, the vagina in and of itself is an organ of expansion. Mm -hmm. So just those things alone, women can have multiple orgasms. Some men can, but women can. So women have this, um, this natural um, uh, ability to be sexual. But again, the narrative that we've been taught is, you know, we are the ones that have to do this. So sometimes it's like, well, when my partner, and again, this is heterosexual couples, um, you know, my wife or my girlfriend, um, she wants to have sex more than I do, and I don't want, like, I'm tired. Like, I need, like, wow. a, week, a week to get my mojo back, and right. then maybe is, um, can cause issues, and, and then there's that, that awkward avoidance and not wanting to talk about it, and that's more distance and more distance and more distance that comes from people. You know, and it's the, the reality is, is again, as human beings, we evolve sexually. So there's going to be times where, you know, we're going to be at like our peak and, you know, things are, we're in that flow state and things are happening. And we're like, yes, like I want lots of sex. Now, it may not be at the same place where your partner's at. And that's OK, but it's, it's also being able to, to look at things from a place of it's not always going to be this way. It's natural to have these ups and these downs as far as, you know, where we're at in our lives. That could be for months. Sometimes it's for years. But the most important thing that's missing for a lot of people is to be able to communicate with their partner about it. The number one thing that I work with people that is makes at least 80% of the difference is working with their communication skills. Ah, and okay. That's the thing. That's the thing, because we're really good at talking about sex with one person, ourselves. And generally speaking, we're terrible 
at talking to other people about sex. Because we've grown in that, that sex negative society that says sex when it looks like this and it fits into this nice little box and our bodies look yep. like this, perform like this, and our partners are like this, and we have this much sex, and our penises are this big, and this many orgasms, and blah, 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 blah. We get caught up in the mathematics of sex, and we're evaluating ourselves. It completely, um, you know, starts to dismantle the connection that you have with your partner, because we're not talking about it. We feel crappy about it. We feel shame. We feel guilt. We feel small. And we've never been told how to or taught how to or have the resources to communicate. So that's a huge part of everything yeah. that I do. If it's the private practice that I have or speaking at conferences is how the F do we take the crazies, which I call them, and we all have them, that are running around in our head that we don't know what to do with. How do we take that, be responsible for that, and communicate in a way to our partner or our partners so we get to actually have the type of connection and the type of sex that we want. And it's interesting you're sharing that. And I'm thinking as you're sharing with us, if you take a man that when he was younger was not given proper education about sex. Yep. And then this, all these subjects, but like especially this subject about libido. Mm -hmm. And then also over periods of time, men don't have the same libido. And mm -hmm. they sort of... It, it must be sometimes challenging in coaching some of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's there's a lot of work when I initially um, work with people. It, the first step that I work with, it's it's uh, the process that I've developed is called the sexual freedom system. But the first step that I work with people on is developing sexual self-awareness. And one of the steps is understanding what I call your sexual blueprint. So what are all the different messages that you receive? What are all the different imprints that create who you are sexually? Because most people walk around the world sexually unconscious. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. This is gross. This is sexy. This is perverted. This is what gets my dick hard. And, you know, that's, that's it. They just, like, walk through the world and that's what it is. Not really thinking of, well, where did this come from? And, and why am I this way? Mm -hmm. You know, when we were born, we were born with two fears. The fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. Everything else has been learnt. And so doing this work of understanding your sexual blueprint is like, oh, okay, now I know why I'm like that. And, hey, that serves me. Good. High five. Thumbs up. Keep it. But this is also an opportunity for men to go through that and be like, oh, yeah, this, this, I know this happened at that time. Like, I got caught masturbating and, you know, my dad caught me and he, like, beat me or he shamed me and I was grounded. He told me that I was dirty and never do it again. So I was nine years old. So shit. You know, I didn't do anything and, and I was I was good and I, I you know, hit it. I didn't stop doing it because it felt really good. But I hit it and I never talked to anyone about it. And, and I was like super careful and I knew this was like a really shameful place. And now I'm 35 years old and I want to have a connection with my partner. And I can't because I have all this shame and this guilt about you know, my penis or my sexual pleasure or touch or what that looks like. And it gets in my way. So that's really where, like you, you said, like all these different factors come into play to make a very complex um, uh, combination uh, of, of, you know, these influences that, that create who a person is sexually. So that's why I take it to the very, very base level of like, okay, what actually created you sexually? What works for you? What doesn't work for you? And let's do some work on the stuff that doesn't work for you so you can have it so it does work for you so you can have the sex that you want in your life. Excellent. Uh, let's get to another conversation piece. And you mentioned briefly, but I know you, you have some thoughts on it. The whole impact of pornography mm -hmm. when it comes to men and sexuality and it. And especially, too, in, in line, too, with social media, it's become more and more pervasive in society. Yeah, I remember growing up in Lynn Valley, and uh, I remember my first uh, uh, porno magazine uh, was stolen for me by a friend of mine. He lives in Japan right now. I'm not going to mention his name because it's a long time ago. But it was like the holy grail. I remember like getting this thing, and I remember I was in band, and we had this um, – uh, all I wanted to do was go home and like, you know, read it. 
right? Um, but we had this uh, band competition that I had to go in. I remember I put it in my saxophone case, and I had to carry my saxophone, obviously, to this competition. I took a bus there, and I was, like, mortified that someone was, like, randomly going to my saxophone case and find this porno, right? But that's what it was. It was porno magazines. Now, it's, you know, we, like, do a search on our phone, and we get anything and everything that's out there. So there's, uh, you know, people have very strong opinions on porn. And you go online, you see lots of people that say it's, like, Again, end of days, and it's uh, corrupting um, men and conditioning them to, to see women and sex in a particular way. And um, I think that is true in particular situations. And it's also, you know, porn when it's used not as uh, an education tool, but it's created to titillate and to excite. Um, it can be a place to look at and explore um, with a partner of different things that you want to try and be able to like look it up and be like, hey, you know, is this something that we want to try? Let's let's look at it. Um, but, you know, if we, we look at the, the, the dangerous side of things, again, it's we're not going to stop porn. It's always going to be there. You know, we may have, uh, you know, different software to limit what our, our sons or our brothers um, can see at home. But listen, I don't know about you, but when I was that age, if there's a will, there was a way, and we stole it at that time, right? It's a lot easier. It's a lot more accessible. So one of the things that's so important is knowing that they're going to be curious about it, knowing that they will access it, is having the conversations. It's having those um, meaningful conversations to share and bestow um, the wisdom that you have with the younger generation to, to offset or complement what they're seeing and what they're taking in because the reality is you know those male myths that we started talking about those are so prevalent in porn and um, you know the reality is is when the olympics are on right and i'm watching or someone's watching you know the 100 meter dash they're not like oh yeah i'm gonna go be uh usain bolt and i'm gonna go like run like that okay we don't think like that these are highly trained athletes that spend a lot of time and a lot of focus on being able to do that. Now, when we watch porn, we do have that occurring. Oh, this is what it's got to look like. This is what I have to look like. This is what my penis has to look like. This is how long. This is the position. This is like all this other kind of stuff that we have to do. The reality is, and I've been on porn sets, and I've, I've talked to porn stars. I have friends who are porn stars. It's, it's not like that. There's a lot that you know, back in the day, we'd say gets left on the editing room floor. Um, and now it's, you know, gets left on, you know, the, the desktop of someone's MacBook Pro as they're editing this stuff. But, um, you know, we're not sexual athletes. We don't train to do this. We don't have, um, you know, a world that revolves around our performance. And that's really what it is. It's a performance. You know, similarly, we don't... Um, uh, you know, look at movies, like go to a regular movie and see, I don't know, like Mission Impossible and Tom Cruise, like climbing up the outside of a, of a building and being like, oh, I should be able to do that. But again, because we, we grow up in this place of um, so limited in our um, understanding of ourselves sexually and conditioned uh, um, by all these, uh, what I call the sins which are the standards, ideals, norms, and expectations of uh, society or for ourselves, you know, we have this attachment that, hey, it, it's got to look like what I see, you know, on, on my computer screen or on my phone screen. I guess in today's world with so much distraction, again, the whole area when it comes to pornography is about the fantasy and reality bit. And mm -hmm. it, gets, it gets more and more blown out of proportion because we're living in such a media crazy, information crazy society, it doesn't. We don't. We don't take the time to think about reality. We're just so caught up in the fantasy. Well, I mean, it can be that way. I mean, I don't know if, um, like, uh, and this is something that I work with people a lot because there's like the fantasy world and reality. And right. again, some of the common uh, issues that I have is people will come to me like Stephen this is what turns me on or this is what I masturbate to or this is the fantasy that I have and they're like worried about this like switch over into reality and I tell them I'm like listen those 
those two areas are very, very different. If someone had a window into all uh, our minds and I'll just own it inside my mind, you know, all the crazy stuff that goes like, not even sexual, I'd be like locked up, right? Well, all these different things that are going off of like, oh, if this goes here and I do this and like, oh, if I was in this situation, what if I did this, you know, blah, 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 you know, I'd be locked up. But again, it's, it's more of that. And, and, and again, this is my experience growing up Catholic. Like, if you think about it, it's it's really bad and it's really wrong. And so, so one of those areas that that I like to focus on is differentiating between, hey, there is a fantasy world, and this is something that turns you on and you enjoy, and it's honoring that sexual relationship that you have with yourself. So the longest lasting, most reliable, most satisfying sexual relationship you'll ever have in your life is the one that you have with yourself. And that's something to honor, and that's something to respect. And if you flip the script, if you look at the reality of your world that's different from your fantasy, it may look different. You know, you may be uh, married. Um, you may um, have a wife. And your, your porn and what you look at does not look anything like the sex that you have in reality. Or there's not the potential to have that in reality because of the, you know, the agreement spoken and unspoken that you have with your partner. But the fantasy world is that place where you can, you can enjoy yourself and you can enjoy that. And if you're, if you're looking at how to cross those two over, you know, or integrate some of that into your world, there's ways of doing it. And again, people get caught up in like, it's got to look like this fantasy thing. And I'm like, oh my goodness, like, it's not going to look like that. Don't try and make it look like that because things will go downhill really quick. Absolutely. So some, some of the things that I offer to people when they're looking at like, hey, I want to explore something new is take baby steps. It doesn't have to look like the full blown thing. Take baby steps, go slowly, communicate. So... Um, do you mind, Dr. Ryb, if I share? There's uh, like Absolutely. A no, if it's your show, I'm just steering the ship, my brother. Go for it. So there's there's a five-step process that I, I share with people um, if they're connecting with a new partner um, or they're trying something new um, with an existing partner. And it's called SWAT-B. So S-W-A-T-B, SWAT-B. So the first thing that you want to talk about is you want to have safe words. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with safe words, um, safe words is something that either stop or slow down the sexual interaction. And they're not stop or slow down, okay? Because sometimes stop or like slow, they could be, it could be increased and people use that to increase the sexual tension. So what a safe word or safe words are is something that you would never say in a sexual encounter. So some of the easy ones are red for stop and orange for slow down. Right? Mine are taxi for stop and ham hocks to slow down. And everybody kind of laughs at that because they're like, why? What, what is ham hocks? And that's exactly it. If I say ham hocks, my partner's going to go, like, what? Why? What? Oh, oh, I got to slow down. So the first thing is to have safe words. Both of you. The second one is so W is talk about your well being. And this could be both physical and emotional and psychological. It could be like, hey, I was at the gym and I like, pulled my hamstring or, you know, you know, uh, she was curling her hair and she burnt her forearm or something like that. Find out, you know, if there's anything going on with you physically that you need to be aware of. And then also emotionally, like, are you sad? Are you depressed? Are you happy? Are you excited? Like, is there something that your partner needs to know about like the emotional place that you're in? And again, that piggybacks into the psychological realm. Like what's, what's going on for you right now? So those are things, again, as you explore, and with a new partner or trying new things, our conversations to have. Nice. So, so SWA, so A, you want to talk about aftercare. So aftercare is what happens after you connect sexually or what happens after you explore. So if you're exploring something new with a partner and um, it could bring up a lot of things, it could trigger things for them, it could trigger things for you. And so you want to have, you want to talk about what aftercare could look like. This could be snuggling, it could be having a cup of tea, it could be going, it could be having a shower together, it could be going for food, it could be whatever, but like what brings you both back into equilibrium that you feel good about the experience? So that's S-W-A-T is what are your triggers or what are their triggers? And triggers are could be anything that take you out of a sexual headspace. 
It could be something that someone says. It could be a nickname. It could be uh, um, something uh, physical that they do or touching your body in a particular way or anything else like that. It's, it's just anything that will take you out of a sexual headspace because that's the worst thing. And I think, you know, a lot of people have experienced that, one, if they're, you know, trying something new or, two, um, with a new partner and you're like, whoa, that's not sexy or that, like, ugh, you know, just didn't work. So talk about triggers. What doesn't work for you? And the last one is really important is boundaries. So what are their boundaries and what are your boundaries? And trust me, you have boundaries. And tr and trust me, they have boundaries. So if they say, oh, I'm up for anything, I don't have boundaries, like, you just got to be like, no, <laughs> that's not the way, that's not the way it is. Everybody has boundaries and it's important to talk about. And there's two types of boundaries. The first boundary is a hard boundary. That means like, nope, not today, not happening. It's like, it's not even on the menu. Like, don't even, don't even bring it up. It's not something that I'm comfortable with at this time of my life, and that's perfect. That's something that you own, and and respect that for yourself, and that for your partner to own and respect that, you know, on uh, uh, on your behalf, you know, towards them. And so those are hard boundaries. They're also soft boundaries. So soft boundaries is there's flexibility. So it's something that you're open to or they're open to under a particular set of circumstances. So it could be like you're on vacation or it's your birthday or it's, I don't know, whatever it is. But that is a soft boundary, but it's not, that boundary is not crossed until there's a conversation about it between the two of you. So that's something that I, I, I think is uh, a, just a framework for people to work on and work with their partners on to really set a strong foundation to build off of. So that's something that I offer um, to people, you know, all over the world, and it and it works. Communication is so important, and if you can cover those five things, you're well on your way to you know developing some really great communication skills. And you know, and I love Stephen because the last conversation piece we're going to chat about was how to have more of the sex you want more frequently and he just laid the foundation there yes. yes he just he just and that's us good radio guys good media guys they just know how to just flow in so you know <laughs> I, I i i got I, I i'm loving i'm just sitting back and enjoying the ride here um yes as we wind down our conversation i definitely want you to talk about your book ah yes um so my book is and i alluded to it um earlier it's called the sexual freedom system um winning the inner game of sex so again, we're so focused on like what's out there, like how hot, how hot are they, and like oh she's got the perfect body, or I want to get that, or you know she, my wife used to look like that, and uh, you know it's it's always out there with someone else, like the barista at Starbucks is really hot, and so this is uh, a, 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 a an opportunity for for people at end for you know specifically we're talking about men to really understand themselves and rather than trying to find great sex out there over there in a relationship it's understanding yourself as being the source of that and to bring great sex to a relationship so the four steps that i go through is developing sexual self-awareness developing sexual self-esteem so you gotta love and accept yourself and not make you wrong yourself wrong for who you are sexual responsibility so you actually own who you are and responsible for that and then authentic sexual self-expression so that's you actually get to communicate this in a way that you're empowered, you feel comfortable of who you are and what you want, regardless of who you are and what you want. And I really mean that in all stretches of the word. It could be you're, you're married and you want a different type of sex. It may be you're single and you want lots of sex and you want lots of sex with different partners. Okay, great. How do you own that and not be caught up in um, the gamification of sex and, um, you know, just like disrespect, like all that crap that's really prevalent in our world when it comes to navigating sex. So it's called the Sexual Freedom System, Winning the Inner Game of Sex, um, and uh, that's available on my on my website in hard copy as well as uh, an ebook format as well. Just out of curiosity, how long did it take you to write it? Oh gosh, wrong yeah. question. So, <laughs> there was, it, it took me about three years to write that's okay. it. It was like, you know. It was off and on, and I'm not I'm not a, a writer as my first book. You know, I'll probably Same write here. Book, but it was, uh, you know, it was the summer of 2014 where I really was like, okay, guess what, Stephen? Um, I know you'd like to go outside in the sunshine because Toronto is a beautiful city in the summer, um, but you're not going to, and you're going to write a book. 
and I just really, you know, muscled through it, literally and figuratively, um, for about three months, and then you know uh, published it, and and then have. But it was it was it was it was a journey. That's a for labor sure. of love. Yeah, absolutely. Well, congratulations on that success. Uh, before yeah. we let you go, do you have any final words you'd like to share with us, and also your contact information? Yeah. Um, so uh, my contact information, if people go to drdewitt.com, so that's D-R-D-E-W-I-T.com. I'm on there. Uh, Instagram, uh, D-R-D-E-W-I-T. Um, Twitter, all my social media is pretty much D-R-D-E-W-I-T. People can email me. Just be like straight. If there's something that you got going on, you don't know what to deal with, you don't know who to talk to, you know, I'm I'm your guy, and we can we can talk, and and I love you know if that's a if that's a phone call, and I can it's like 20 minutes, and it's a high five afterwards, or we work together, that's fine. So I'm at Stephen, so that's S T E P H E N at drdewitt.com, D R D E W I T dot com. So that's that's what's there. Um, you know, I also want to you know invite men out to the Men and Masculinity Summit and women out to the Men and Masculinity yes, Summit. Yes. That's the co-ed conference it's happening november 19th this sunday it's at uh the marriott uh, 90 bloor street and um it's going to be a phenomenal gonna, i'm going to be speaking um dr john Izzo, uh jeff tomlinson um uh, uh carlin costa uh, carla costa um there's just a, a wonderful uh variety of both men and women speaking about um you know some of the um, the places where we are right now and the places that we want to go and what we need to, to do to get there and dropping that, that mask of, of masculinity. We talked about it in the myths today. So um, they can go to menandmasculinity.com. You can Google it, um, and there's tickets available um, still for this, for this Sunday. So, and I'm going to be there. So you can be like, hey, Steven, you know, hi, you know, I'm, I'm really friendly. Sometimes people are like, oh, he's like this sex doctor. <laughs> like, hey, I'm on the Dr. Vibe show. You know, it's there all good. There you go. Now, well, they um, know, they, they'll they know who you truly are because they just have to come to the Dr. Vibe show and just check it out. So the, he, he is what he is, you know. So there you go. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for taking time in your positive, productive schedule to share with us. All the contact information that he shared with us is will be on part of the post for the replay so his website facebook linkedin twitter instagram email will all be there and i will second that hey if you're in toronto and if you have some time you want to use valuably whether you're male or female definitely check out the men and masculinity summit at the website address men and masculinity.com or i believe it's on the website just go put in men and masculinity summit in your favorite search engine it'll probably be at the top of the list yeah, and they still have tickets available. So I'm Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show. As always, I'd like to say thank everyone for watching this live on the replay. If you want to watch replays of conversations like this on my YouTube channel, you're already here. Also, if you want to catch replays of my convers epic conversations audio-wise, you can go to the website, the D R V I B E S H O W dot com. You can go to Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Tuned In Radio, Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music Store. Selected replays will be on are at the GoodmanProject.com, which I'm a been a regular contributor for for like four years now. Uh, also WJMS Radio. If you I'm a certified emp uh, empowerment coach. So if you want to get a complimentary 30-minute session with me, please reach out. You can touch base with me at drvibeshow.com. You can also reach out to me. There's a contact page on my website, or you can email me at dr.vibe at the drvibeshow.com. Also realize I'm a brand ambassador for the only African-American magazine that's dedicated to African Americans in food, wine, and food, wine, and um, travel. Sorry, I was going to say culture, but travel, and that's uh, cuisinenoirmag.com. It's Cuisine Noir magazine in full. So we got all that covered. One, three, four last things. First of all, I'm also uh, have a service that I call GettingMediaCoverage.com. And that's where I provide uh, assistance in getting media promotion, so you can elevate your business to the media. And then three last things. Always, first thing, live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Also, sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. And then finally, as always, I like to say, God bless, peace be well, keep the faith. Thanks for watching this live. And as we say in Jamaica, walk good. Good night, everybody. <laughs>